for molecular science and it's a state-of-the-art research facility, uh, all equipped for medical discoveries and we're based at La Trobe University at the Bandura campus. A lot of people ask me, what is a research fellow? Basically, we're a research, medical researcher with a doctorate. Um, and then the next question people ask me, am I a real doctor? Well, it sort of offends me, but we still go through 10 years of university, we get a doctorate. It is different to a medicine degree. The difference is that we develop and design new medications, always to diagnose diseases, or even set out to go understand new diseases, or better understand older diseases, so that we can educate medical professionals, such as clinicians, uh, general practitioners, nurses, on how to better care for their patients, prescribe new medicines, or even um, find better ways to diagnose their patients as well. So technically, we are smarter people. <laughs> so, um, what do I do? I develop blood tests for neurodegenerative diseases. As medical researchers, we've really become more famous during the COVID pandemic because we've been identified as the people who have developed the vaccines and new ways to diagnose COVID um, and even understand COVID better. I don't particularly do COVID. Um, I study neurodegenerative diseases, which is a bunch of brain diseases that causes the brain to degrade over time due to a pathological disease. Many of the um, symptoms that patients uh, experience are called dementia-related symptoms. So in terms of my research team's goal, our goal is to be the world standard in dementia care by developing a non-invasive diagnostic test, which is a blood test, to detect the early degeneration of the brain. So dementia is an umbrella word that we usually use for all of these symptoms. Um, it's a brain condition that is associated with a decline in memory and thinking. So patients have problems with memory, uh, their behaviour changes, they have problems with mobility, I can't see my laser pointer, uh, and they have problems with completing familiar tasks and thinking, but also confused with time and space. So a lot of the audience members today, you're at your prime of memory and thinking, so imagine losing that. And I'm not talking about just easy, you know, forgetfulness that you forgot your mobile phone this morning, it's really the association of familiar memories. So, for example, you catch your grandpa uh, throwing his laundry into the microwave, thinking that the microwave is going to wash his clothes for him. Or maybe your parents are driving you home from school one day and forgetting where your street is. It's that sort of memory. So, worldwide, 50 million people uh, have dementia, and in Australia, there's 450,000. 70% of people with dementia have a disease called Alzheimer's disease. There are three stages of Alzheimer's disease, early, intermediate, and late. And so what happens is that we typically start off with a healthy brain. Uh, and this disease happens between a 10 to 20 year period, silently in the brain, while the patient doesn't experience it. And during this stage, this toxic protein in the brain builds like rust in the brain called amyloid beta. And this starts to destroy the brain. And you can see this healthy brain on the left-hand side, and then on the right, the missing tissue in that brain with Alzheimer's disease. So at the beginning, the amyloid beta starts to eat the region of the brain that controls short-term memory. And this is why the patients start to experience short-term memory loss. A few years later, this, the disease starts to spread across the region of the brain that's involved in judgment and thinking, followed by the area that is involved in visual and motor function. So what we see is that we do have therapeutic drugs that can fix this and stop the de degradation of the brain, but what we know is that patients come to doctors too late so once that brain tissue has died already, it is very difficult to get back. So what we need to do is to be able to diagnose much more earlier while the brain tissue is still intact 
um, so that we can slow and stop the disease. So currently, the age that most of these people get this condition and start to experience symptoms, the onset of symptoms, is 65 years old. This is where they start to see their doctor and they get sent to do brain imaging, which costs about $2,000, requires hospital administration. It's quite, um, there's a waiting list. We also do cerebral spinal testing, which is a big needle gets stuck in your spinal cord and we, we draw forward, which is quite invasive. Sometimes we can only diagnose at time of death, which is obviously much too late. So as I mentioned, um, the disease does start, start happening 10 to, 10, 10 to 20 years prior to the experience of symptoms. So what we want to do is to be able to get patients much early on so that we can test them routinely and determine whether their brain has already started to degrade and therefore we can intervene with medications and save their brain. So I develop blood tests but for brain diseases. And this is quite difficult, in fact. For COVID, it's actually quite easy because once you get infected with COVID, it enters the virus into your bloodstream. We just collect a little bit of blood to detect the virus. But for the brain, it's quite different because the brain is one of our most important organs and it is protected by a barrier. And this barrier has very strict border control measures. This is to allow, not allow viruses to enter our brain or bacteria, and only allow good things to enter our brain. So how does one detect a brain disease in the blood? This is like traditionally we always use brain imaging to detect diseases in the brain, but how do we do this with a blood test? So S, science and STEM. Our research has discovered that the body has an internal postal system of the body. So cells and cells can communicate to each other through sending parcels to each other, they call them parcels. These parcels are biological bubbles called exosomes. So what happens is that, pretend I'm a cell, my body packages these little biological bubbles full of good things or bad things, and it gets secreted through the bloodstream uh, and then a distant or neighbouring cell can actually intercept it, take it up and use its contents and change the behaviour. So it's almost sending one parcel from one household to another. What our technology does is we can actually capture these exosomes in the bloodstream. What's more important than what we discovered is that the brain tissue can also send out these exosomes and exosomes, these particular exosomes, can go through the blood-brain barrier through specialised channels. So we have discovered that these exosomes go through these channels and end up in the bloodstream, and our technology is able to capture that. So T in technology, what we then do is when we capture these exosomes, we can actually pop them open and decode the material inside them. And we use what we call next generation genome sequencing. Also made famous by COVID for contact tracing. We've actually been using these instruments for the past 10 years. I have one in my lab, that costs about a million dollars. Uh, and they decode the genetic material inside. And what we can decipher is what nuclear acids are associated with different diseases. I also work with a team of engineers, we in STEM. And I think this is one of my favourite parts of the job where we get to play with automated robots and customise robotics so that we can speed up the ability, ability to diagnose and screen and test many patients in a day. We also use, have developed this chip here, this chip here, um, where we can load about 20 patients and we can test about 20 patients in two hours. Um, for each of one of those chips with 20 patients, it generates a hell of a lot of data. 20 gigabytes of data per person. So we need a lot of bioinformaticians and biostatisticians, which is the end in STEM. Um, data scientists are in huge demand right now. I work with a great team. Um, their role is really to do a lot of the coding and what we call machine learning. Uh, and they do all the 
biostatistical modeling and predictions, which we have also seen in a lot of uh, COVID during this pandemic to advise the government. Biosecurity and privacy of personal data is also a huge issue uh, in STEM. So these are all very new and growing fields in STEM as well. So at the moment, in terms of all of the fields that are worked with across STEM, um, we have now had this patented technology that's able to capture brain exosomes in the blood and use them to diagnose brain diseases such as Alzheimer's disease. With our clinical work, we have now been able to diagnose the disease three years earlier before patients experience symptoms. So this gives patients time for treatment um, and three years earlier to be able to rescue their brain. At the moment, we're also able to achieve 92% accuracy to predict whether a person will develop Alzheimer's disease. And we're also working towards all different neurodegenerative diseases. The reason why is because all of the symptoms that these diseases, um, the patients experience are all quite common. They all start with um, memory impairment, motor impairment. So when a patient comes to see their doctor, very hard for their clinician to try and decide which type of neurodegenerative disease they might have. And sometimes it can take two years to get a diagnosis, which causes the family involved a lot of stress. So we hope our blood panel called the Dementia Diagnostic Panel help clinicians diagnose their patients much more earlier and so they can have a better, what we call therapeutic window to reverse the disease. So ideally we would like uh, people to be screened every two years, therefore we can pick up the disease earlier, intervene earlier with medications, give the patient the opportunity to improve their lifestyle, slow the disease trajectory, and then enable the patients to have a longer independent life. While we're also moving towards is using our technology, to be able to understand brain development and childhood diseases with the children's hospital, um, in children uh, and toddlers, as well as in adolescents and uh, adulthood, in terms of understanding brain health or brain injury, in terms of the sports field, uh, traumatic brain injury, injury in accidents, for example, and also healthy aging, what it's like to have a healthy brain as you age. So some of you might be wondering how I got this to this career. Well, I finished, um, I would say I went through a traditional academic career. So I finished my BCE. Uh, I went to Monash University and did the Bachelor of Science and Commerce. I really enjoyed the science. So I transferred to La Trobe Uni to do a Bachelor of Medical Science, which is no longer available, but it's basically biomedical science. Uh, I then went back to Monash University to finish my honours in science, and then uh, got awarded a scholarship to do my PhD at Monash. I then did five years of postdoctoral training at the University of Melbourne, and now leading my own lab here, at our building at La Trobe University. I do lead a uh, quite a young diverse team, with all of international and national students and staff, I uh, work with an extremely large amount of external people and collaborators. Uh, we have also moved our lab to China as well, where I look after a lab there as Chief Scientific Officer, where we are now rolling out this test at the five major hospitals in China. And over there, we also have a quite a young diverse team. Um, in terms of being a woman in STEM and a uh, leader, I don't like to highlight myself as a woman, I think. Um, not that it's all the same, but I do find myself sometimes um, the only female in a senior management um, meeting, for example. Uh, sometimes I still try to navigate my way around it, especially where you're in different countries, for example, in China, trying to navigate the cultural differences there. Uh, so what I'd like to sort of share is that 
not so much my leadership skills, but I prefer to see myself as a, a mentor to my team. Um, and the biggest, the biggest, I guess, advice I could give you is that while I try to cultivate an inclusive work environment to share and create ideas, um, being able to mentor young people is probably one of the best parts of my job. Being able to find opportunities for my team and individuals to strengthen their skills and weaknesses is probably something I always try and do as a leader and mentor. Uh, and probably the most fruitful bit on my job is to see the individual identify new opportunities for them to strengthen their weaknesses and their skills. And I don't think you need to wait for your mentor or your parents or your boss to do this for you. I think you can actually start doing this now. And this will really help your EQ, which is the ability to recognize and appropriately react to your emotions and that of those around you. To be honest, the industry I work with, everyone is Smart. Everyone has a certain IQ um, and I believe the difference between you being a good leader or a good team worker is to really work on your EQ. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention.